Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E75. I'm a new face to most of you. My name is Dan Armendaris. I'm taking over for David Malin just for today. Uh, he will be returning next week. Uh, I figure I should just introduce myself just very, very briefly before we dive into more Ajax fun. Uh, I've worked with this course in the in, uh, last year in the spring semester. I was a TF, and in the summer semester, I co-lectured the course uh, with David, and I also lecture a few other courses here at the Extension School as well. Computer Science E7, Exposing Digital Photography. If you're into um, photography at all, then I highly recommend that class, of course, myself being somewhat biased towards it. Um, and um, Computer Science E1, which I lecture, co-lecture with David Malin. And so uh, do feel free if you have any questions to, uh, to let me know. Um, but I figure this is a good time to just dive right in and keep talking about Ajax. So last week, David tells me that he already went over quite a bit of the Ajax material that you really need to know to get you started. And uh, that's all well and great, all of the, uh, the X, XML HTTP request object, all of that stuff that you have to know in order to use Ajax. But there are ways that we can make this easier and that there are ways that we can implement Ajax in such a way that we can do really neat, really fun things uh, over web-based applications uh, to simulate perhaps more local-based applications or uh, just to give your website a, a different feel. And many of you have probably experienced this with, say, uh, a lot of Google's applications. So Google Maps, for example, was one of the first ones that really used Ajax in an effective way, as I'm sure all of you know, using uh, or implementing a Google Maps uh, mashup in Project 3. Um, but it really paved the way now for some of these web applications that exist. And so even Gmail and uh, Google Calendar that use a lot of JavaScript and a lot of Ajax to get data from the server and just put it on the web page without much fuss or without having to reload the page is really a, a definite value add for a lot of these applications. And uh, many other companies now are, um, are beginning to implement web-based applications that are really fantastic. Uh, Apple, for example, uh, has this service, if you're not familiar, um, called Mobile Me. And uh, one of the things that they uh, claim to do is uh, basically have something very similar to uh, Google's web applications. They have uh, Apple's special mail and special calendar all accessible within this. And of course, Apple being Apple, they have to charge an arm and a leg for it. Um, but it, it is also actually a very interesting look uh, into some of the capabilities of Ajax. And so, uh, so all of you that are only familiar with Ajax as far as David got last week are probably wondering how on earth you can make these websites more easily or how you can make uh, these web-based applications with all these fancy layouts and controls and niles and dobs uh, more easily without having to worry about a lot of the low-level implementation details. And that's uh, mostly what I want to be talking about today. And uh, David has alluded to some of the ways uh, that we can do this, and I'm sure most of you have seen them in section as well. But these uh, frameworks, these JavaScript frameworks that exist can really go a long way in, in accomplishing this goal. And so there's a whole bunch of them, uh, Dojo, jQuery, Prototype, Scriptaculous, YUI, uh, XJS. There's a whole bunch of them that, that are out there today. And uh, it's really difficult to recommend one over the other. Many, many of them, just like everything out there today, seems to have advantages and disadvantages over the others. Uh, and, and frankly, there's so many of them, I, I really couldn't tell you what some of the low-level differences are between some of these. Uh, but I can tell you that the ones that, uh, that I like and, and I think that the ones David likes as well, and he, he uses especially in, in this course quite often, are jQuery and YUI. However, you will see as you go to numerous uh, web pages or websites, uh, for example, apple.com will use prototype and jQuery on their corporate web page just because it helps them accomplish some things that they just don't want to have to do, just sit at home uh, typing out all of these lines of code that somebody's already done for us. It can really make it quite easy. Um, and so I figure we should dive into it by just uh, talking about some of these uh, a little bit more and then going into some more detail. So uh, Dojo, like I mentioned, that's, that's one of them. Uh, jQuery, now this is one that we're going to focus on uh, quite a bit tonight just because 
This is one that, uh, that I'm familiar with, the one that I'm sure most of the TFs are, are familiar with, and, and David as well. Uh, and then we have some of the other ones that I mentioned, Prototype, Scriptaculous, and uh, YUY. And um, one of the great things about jQuery and YUY, especially over the older ones, or not the older ones, but the other ones, is that they have really good documentation. And so uh, YUI in particular has tons and tons of examples, lots and lots of documentation. They seem to work uh, more on their documentation and on their examples than on the, on the script itself, which isn't to say that their scripts are, are worthless because they're actually really good and, and really quite useful, but they obviously put a lot of time into this stuff. Okay, so talking about uh, jQuery, now, the way that a lot of these work is that you download uh, or reference a JavaScript file that you get from their website. And uh, it's usually a, a few dozens or so kilobytes in size, and then you reference it using uh, a link tag or, uh, or a script tag in your head uh, of, of your web page. And then you have access to the various uh, implementations that they allow. And if you go... Um, if you visit a lot of their documentation, they will show you examples and, and how some of this stuff works. Um, but what these uh, frameworks really try to help you with is simplifying a lot of these processes or a lot of these things. So for example, let's say you need to modify or uh, add some particular element somewhere within the DOM. So you need to find some specific element within the DOM, modify it somehow, or you want to add an element to the DOM. Uh, these can really... Uh, these things will help you uh, do that. So just to give a quick example, um, I have here uh, the website for Computer Science E7. And one of the uh, assignments in this course is that students are to take a photo for the banner and then also design um, a color theme for the website. So if you, uh, so for example, if we just click on this a couple of times, you'll notice that as, as the banner changes, so does the theme. And so uh, this seemed like a neat way to have students um, just be more interactive with the course itself. And so this web page was designed to help them preview what the, um, their color theme would look like. And so this is actually uh, somewhat basic. If we were just to view the source of this, uh, there's, there's not a lot to this JavaScript, um, but let's say that we needed to do this. What, how on earth could we accomplish this goal of changing the theme live on the website? Any ideas? <coughs> right, so we could use JavaScript to adjust the CSS. How, more specifically? Right, that's very good. So we can just create a new CSS, and then when some event fires, we can swap the old CSS for the new CSS. And that is exactly uh, what happens here. So for example, let me just show you some, some of the CSS that exists. One, that we have a couple of style sheets in this course. One of them uh, is, is purely for the, uh, the layout of the page, but then the other one is only for the color. And you'll notice that there's not a lot of colors in the theme. There's actually four distinct colors. Um, but by using, uh, by using PHP to generate a CSS file, we can then very easily just somehow give the PHP file those four colors, and then it can spit out to us a CSS file with all of the color attributes that we want it to be. And uh, this PHP file can work, uh, just quickly, it works over sessions so that uh, someone who's navigating the site will, won't change themes while they, while they navigate through it, so it'll maintain the same color theme. But also you can pass to it, via four arguments, new colors that will then be output in CSS, and then you can uh, preview them on the page. So if we go back to the previous site, you'll notice, uh, or to the previous page, rather, you'll notice that we have um, four text boxes where we can enter in some colors. So I'll just make something really obnoxious. I'll say that the page color is going to be all black, and then I want the content to be uh, all white, and then let's say the highlight, uh, I'll make uh, red, and the text color is going to be green. And so I'm just inputting hexadecimal numbers here, and, and 
and, and I apologize for, for destroying all of your eyes with this theme, um, but you can see that as soon as I click on the button, it doesn't refresh, it just loads a new CSS theme. And so you might say, well, you could do this using Ajax, but that's not really, it's, that's not exactly what's happening. So let's take a look at this code here. We have the JavaScript code here. Uh, we have just a function that verifies the colors just to make sure that it's a, a valid hexadecimal number. That's nothing that is too surprising. And then uh, we have a function called change theme. So let me just bring this up on my screen so I can see what I'm talking about as well. So now you notice that there's, there's four lines. It basically just reads those four values and puts them into variables. And then, um, assuming that after it tests all four colors, you'll, you'll see here that it says uh, it's going to test every color here to make sure that it's valid. Uh, there's probably a better way to do this, but it was just, this was just meant to be quick and dirty, and I just tested all four very quickly. Uh, so after it does all four, we see this mess of JavaScript code. Let me make it a little bit bigger. What is going on in this mess of code that's here? Right, so the, well, okay, so the first line says that it's going to create a new variable called head ID, and we're going to find a t uh, an element called the head. And so it's going to get all of the elements by the tag name head, and then since that it returns an array of head elements, it's going to return the first one. So that's that, what that zero bracket is. It's returning the first head elements, which is the only head element that we have in this page. Then it says it's going to create a new node and here, this is just going to create a, a new uh, DOM node that is going to be called link. So this is, so basically what we are doing is just creating, it's as if we are, uh, via the DOM, writing a new link within our head tag. Now, we haven't inserted it into the head tag. We just have found the head tag, so we know where it is. We can reference it. Then you notice that we are adding some attributes to this. We add the type. Uh, so we want it to be text CSS, which is obvious because it, we are now importing a CSS file. I won't write all of this stuff out just to give you an idea. So we have a type attribute of, uh, with value text CSS, uh, and it's a style sheet, and then there's an href. And you notice that this link here passes in the four values of colors that the PHP file can then process and then spit back out to us the actual CSS file. Okay, so then once it has created this DOM, then it appends the child called new node, which is this link text or is this link object in, in memory. It appends that to the head. And this is actually, uh, frankly, we're pretty lucky that this works because all of a sudden the browser then downloads what should be the new CSS file, and since CSS that has been uh, downloaded later than, uh, than previous CSS will actually overwrite the previous color. So it will over, overwrite all of the previous colors that were used in the previous theme, and it will change the color. But we have added a new DOM node to it. And so this is not the most obvious of paths. We, there's probably some way that we could simplify this, especially if there's some better way of trying to find this head element, or is the, if there is some way uh, that we can insert a new child into uh, the head element, it would make our life a lot easier if we were to maintain this same sort of idea in order to, to actually change this color theme. So there are probably different ways to accomplish this same goal, but one of them is to not use JavaScript in, this, in its entirety like this, and it would be to use something like jQuery or to use one of these frameworks. And so what, um, what these, uh, let's see, where is our jQuery? Here it is. So uh, what these frameworks do for us is that it eases this process of finding nodes, of modifying nodes, maybe not creating nodes. We still have to type in uh, a lot of text in order to give a node an attribute and, and a value. But we can then uh, find nodes very easily and, and not do it and perhaps in such a, a hacky way. 
And so there's uh, a variety of ways that, that, Drake, that jQuery works. And I'll give you an example in, in just a second. But just a high level, it, it allows you to find certain elements using different uh, selectors. So you can use CSS style selectors. Uh, you can search through the DOM using uh, some uh, using some special jQuery specific syntax. You can it'll help you find specific elements within the DOM. Uh, and there's just a whole variety of ways that this will ease finding something for you. So to give you an example, uh, I have written some code here, and all of this code. Um, that I'm about to show you will be on the course website uh, pretty soon, probably by tonight. It's certainly it's up there now. It's just there's no link to it quite yet. Um, so we have jQuery one, and so um, I guess it would be beneficial if I actually showed you the um, if I showed you what this is supposed to do first. And so it's very very simple. Um, it's a very, very simple page. All of that it is meant to do is uh, to show you a way that we can find and select specific elements within the page very, very easily. All right, so we have here. jQuery 1. And my awesome rendition involves three buttons on a page. And you can see that we have an Enable All button, a Disable All button, and an Ajax button. The Ajax button right now doesn't do anything, but what we're going to focus on first are these Enable and Disable buttons. And so they will do eventually what it sounds like. When we click on one, we want to be able to disable all of the buttons. And what this means is that we are searching through the DOM in some way, finding each of these elements, and changing some attribute in them to disable them. So then the browser can then say, OK, we, I know that I need to disable this particular button. And so this is one specific example, but this is indicative of, of what you can do uh, with jQuery in a more general sense, how you can find specific elements much more easily. So if I click the Disable All button, um, yeah, it's, it's disabled them all. So it's not extremely apparent, but I can't click on these anymore. There's actually a there's been a change. So these buttons are now disabled. And so uh, this is actually surprisingly simple to do with jQuery. So I downloaded the jQuery library, and I've referenced it here. So I basically am just importing it using a script tag so that the, the browser is sure to load it. Then what I do is I have a function that is called by the button when I click it, the disable all button. And that disable all function does this, dollar sign, print, quote, colon, submit, end quote, end print sign, dot, attribute, uh, disabled, disabled. So this looks maybe a little bit messy, but once we break it down, it becomes very easy. Yes? So, right, so um, unlike YUI, which has it's all of its different libraries splintered across many, many different types. Most all of jQuery is here in the jQuery, in the, in the one jQuery library. And in fact, most of, uh, most of these frameworks are that way as well. All of their functionality pretty much comes out of one main file. Now, there's additional functionality that you can get, uh, which are like plugins, essentially, where you can download the main jQuery file, which is, which is required for those plugins. But then you can also add additional plugins, like uh, there's some animation stuff and some, and some UI stuff that you can add. And usually then you would have to add more than just the jQuery. But in this case, uh, in order to gain access to these, these selections and these modifications and of attributes, uh, this is all we have to do. Um, and in fact, when we start talking about Ajax, using jQuery for Ajax as well, you really don't have to do anything but add this jQuery uh, JavaScript file as well. OK. So let's just break it down. This is really easy. Now, don't be confused by this dollar sign. This is just the jQuery object. This is what they do. This makes it very easy for you to reference their object. And that means that all of the stuff that you find in their documentation can be referenced via this dollar sign object. A lot of frameworks will do this. Um, I, I, I'm blanking now at which ones, but I think like Prototype, Scriptaculous, at least some others also use this dollar sign notation to, to reference their, spe their specific object. And if you happen to use more than one um, uh, framework on your page at once, uh, 
usually one of these will have to devolve to some other name. So let's say we had a prototype and uh, Scriptaculous and jQuery loaded in that order. jQuery would most likely load not with the dollar sign, but with uh, a, an object name of jQuery. Uh, so sometimes you will see this dollar sign, sometimes you won't. Just realize that uh, it has to s detect if that dollar sign is already in use. Okay, so this dollar sign is our jQuery object, and we are going to pass to it this text, colon, submit. Now this colon submit, if we were to look on the jQuery documentation, if I have it somewhere, uh, it's actually... Uh, it's actually one of their means of traversing through the DOM. So uh, you'll notice that they have a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, let's see. Oops. It's a selector. So this is a jQuery-specific way of finding some set or some subsets of elements. And so you can see we have a variety of, of ways of finding elements here. Uh, we can find the first of an element, the last of an element. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger so that I'm sure everybody can read it. Um, but we can also find specific elements within it. And so in this case, we are looking for uh, a submit button. But in this case, it's all of the submit buttons. So very easily, we're just able to find this, all of the submit buttons that exist. And if we were to scroll down, we find that we have, in fact, three submit buttons in the XHTML. So it's found all three of those submit buttons and now what we want to do is modify the attributes of those submit buttons. So now we, instead of um, having them be enabled, we give them an attribute of disabled with the value of disabled, which by the way is, is required for most modern browsers to actually disable uh, a submit button before. Some older browsers would allow you to disable them just by having an attribute called disabled with no value. That's not true anymore in order to, for it to be uh, uh, correct and, and XHTML valid, you must have the disabled attribute and value. So that's why it's there twice. So we're adding now a disabled attribute with the value of disabled. And this disables all three of our submit buttons. Pretty easy, very simple, and it gets right to the point, and that's it. This is pretty easy. Yes? What do you mean? Is there one object per function? You said the DOM sum was the object? Yes, it's the jQuery object. Uh huh. Okay. So within a function, I can have only one object? No, no. It's, it's, you can uh, reference the dollar sign as many times as you want within a function. You can, um, the, as, we, as I show you some more examples, you'll see that, that I reference the jQuery object not once, but twice, maybe even more times than that. Uh, sometimes you can even nest the jQuery object within itself if you want to find some, well, it gets a little complicated, but if you want to find some specific element that you want to then perform some uh, modification on some sub-elements or something like that, then you can do some really complex stuff with this. But uh, we could actually uh, find additional, if we wanted to do something else to this, uh, to this file, then we could, um, oops, then we could add additional um, dollar signs to this JavaScript and then just add whatever selectors, modifications we want. And in fact, that's sort of what this jQuery 2 does. So what the next iteration of this script does for us is you'll notice that when I um, disabled all the buttons, it also disabled the enable all button, which means that there's no way for me of re-enabling all of the buttons, which makes it a really poorly coded and, and pretty pointless exercise. So what I need to be able to do now is when I disable all, I've disabled all of them except the enable all, if that makes sense. And so, of course, there are other ways you could do this. You could make the disable all button. You could change it into an enable all button and, and just not disable that one. That's not the argument here. The argument here is that we are just now building upon this same example that we had. So jQuery 2, it's exactly the same HTML except for the JavaScript. So now you'll notice that in our disable all function, what we are going to do is first exactly the same thing we had before. We're going to disable all of the submit buttons that exist within the DOM. But then what we are going to do is find that one button that we want to re-enable and just re-enable it. So now what we're going to do is find all submit buttons. So you'll notice that again we have the, the jQuery object right here. We're finding all submit buttons. 
But then within that subset of DOM elements that we have found, we can perform even more searches. And we can find, in this case, EQ it means equals. It's the first element in, within this submit array. So remember that arrays are zero index, so we don't get the very first one, which is disable all, but we get the second, called number one, the enable all button. And then we can disable its disabled attribute, right? Which means that we re-enable that button. Now, this is obviously a very stupid way of doing this. If I can avoid having to disable a button and then re-enabling it, I should try to do that. But just realize that this exists uh, just as an example. OK, so now that my enable all button remains enabled, I can then add the JavaScript code necessary to actually perform enabling all of all of the buttons. And you'll notice that this is very easily done. Uh, we could just use, uh, we could find all the submit buttons and just turn off or just remove that disabled value from the dis this disabled attribute. Or we could do it this different way, uh, which is just an example of another method that we can use to find a specific object using jQuery. So in this case, we, are, we want to find all of the, the submit buttons within the DOM. And you can actually use XPath style queries within jQuery to find some specific element within it. So if we want to find all of the elements of type input, then uh, we can do that. And then we would have uh, its attribute type and then its value be submit. So what we are looking for is the, the element that is of type input that has a type submit, if that makes sense. So by scrolling down, hopefully, maybe if, if that doesn't quite make sense, realize that we have an element here. This is an input element that we have found. And then more specifically than that, we wanted to find all, all of the input uh, ones that had the attributes type and the value submit. So you can do XPath query styles here. And you'll notice that there is a slight difference. Uh, in the old version of jQuery, they used to have it be more XPath style, where it would have the at sign uh, before the attribute name that uh, when you wanted to do a search for the attribute. Um, you guys did XPath, right? I'm not talking to, OK, good, <laughs> just making sure. So um, it, in the old version of jQuery, they would have the at sign before the attribute name when you wanted to search for the attribute. That's been deprecated in the new version of jQuery. So don't use the at sign. Just type in the attribute name and then the value that you want to find as well. So then now that we've found all of those elements, we can then re-enable them. OK, well, now we want to do a less stupid way of disabling all of the buttons. So jQuery 3 does exactly that. So now we can simplify this to just basically one line of code where we can find all of the elements except the one that we don't want to disable. So again, we can just use a very simple XPath style query where we find all of the elements of type input that are not equal to submit one. Now this works in the, in the case of this page. <clears throat> Excuse me. This works in the case of this page because we don't have a lot of input elements, just the buttons. But you can uh, come up with some valid XPath query that, that you can use to actually search for this. OK. So we are now looking for all of the input elements that have an attribute name whose name is not equal to submit1. And you'll see that we've given all of these buttons names that we can select. And of course, we have now. Uh, just gone back to this more simplified way of finding all of the submit buttons uh, when we are re-enabling them. And we can just re-enable all of the buttons at once. Any questions on this stuff so far? OK. All right. So I don't want to bore you too much with that selector stuff. It's just meant to show you uh, what is possible using jQuery. You can find a lot of these elements within the DOM modify them as necessary. You can modify their attributes, but you can also, just like we have an inner HTML method within JavaScript, you also have an HTML method within jQuery where you can modify the actual HTML of an element itself. So rather than uh, doing this pointless exercise of turning off and turning back on buttons, you can actually do something useful, like input actual HTML, maybe some data that you got back from an AJAX query, for example. So in order to show you how easy jQuery makes this, I figure I should first show you how difficult a normal AJAX query is. So um, I have an example here uh, where all I am doing is 
calling via AJAX the server time that exists uh, or the time that the server has. And so if we wanted to do this AJAX query normally, what would we have to do? Without jQuery, without any of these uh, fancy frameworks that we have. If we just want to perform a simple AJAX query to the server and get the server's time back. So, okay, well, but where's the get time? So, well, okay, fine. So, <laughs> we can make this a very, very simple on, in PHP, and we can just say that uh, we can create the time, package it into an array along with just some random number just to prove that we are actually fetching real data, and then we can uh, JSON encode that and just send it back, just echo it out, which means that uh, through an AJAX query, we would get that data back from uh, from the server. This should all, this should be, this should make sense, right? Any questions on this? Okay. Now in order to do that, normally uh, what we would have to do is actually try initiating an XML HTTP request object. And if that fails because it's IE or some other browser that doesn't support it, we would have to try to instantiate the ActiveX form of that object. And so we can go through uh, a fairly lengthy try uh, uh, try catch process of it trying to instantiate an XHR or an XML HTTP request object. So this is basically the same code that you saw last week from David, uh, and and I know that because I swiped it from him. Because this is frankly difficult. It's hard to remember. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's it doesn't scale very well. You have to remember all of different X, the ActiveX objects for different versions of Internet Explorer. Uh, I think the the Wikipedia page, thankfully. Uh, for Ajax puts all of this stuff right in one uh, in one little box for you, but still, it's just not very clean. It's not a very good way to do that. So once you have instantiated this object through some means, uh, hopefully some through some browser that can actually support the XML HTTP request object, uh, then you just just do the simple stuff. You just make sure that that object exists. Otherwise, uh, the browser doesn't support Active or uh, not ActiveX, but Ajax. Then what we want to do is construct the URL that, is, that we are actually going to query for the data. So that PHP file I showed you was named json.php. We're just going to pass it some numerical ID. And this, if you remember, uh, the PHP file was too simple to do anything with any sort of query string. So it's going to ignore it, but that's fine. It's just a reminder that we can pass in data in this way. Uh, and then as soon as and then what we are going to do is uh, create a lambda function, or just a function that's, that stands by itself, pass it into the on ready state change um, method, and just allow all the rest of this to fall into place. So if you remember, um, we, have to, we have to check if the ready state is equal to 4, which means that we have uh, successfully received the, the final request. Then if this, the HTTP status itself is 200, which means OK, rather than 404, 403, which would imply some sort of error on my part, uh, then what we are going to do is evaluate the text that came back from the server. And just a quick reminder, the reason that we do this with JSON is that it's basically just a JavaScript object. And when we evaluate it, it then becomes like a live object. It's as if you have that object available to you within your JavaScript code. And so then you can access properties within it uh, using this period notation. Uh, so you can access, for example, the server time value within the data object that was returned. And just as a reminder, if we go back here, we can see that we are passing two variables back within this data object, the server time and just some random number. So we can just very quickly, very easily access the server time by um, by using this dot notation. Then we can do this document dot uh, get element by ID, and which is uh, there's some particular element in there that's going to accept this text, and then that text will be placed into it. So this is just a quick reminder of how Ajax works. Is there any questions? Are there any questions on this before we move on to the fun stuff? All right, so just to show you um, that this works, um, this is just going to be, this is just a, now, rather than just have a very simple three-button uh, web page, I now have added a very fancy text field, or it's actually just a paragraph here. So as soon as I click Ajax, uh, 
a few moments later, the query has been performed and the data itself has been placed into the page. Okay. Now this is the stupid way to do it. Well, you have a lot of control over the XML HTTP request object, but there are much simpler ways of doing this using any one of these. And, and David, I think, showed you how to do this using YUI, but I want to show you how to do this using jQuery just to show you that um, this is quite easy to do with a variety of frameworks that exist today. Let's see, jQuery. So in jQuery 4, we have basically all of the same functionality that we had before, but we also have added now this AJAX capability that we can uh, through the power of jQuery. So in jQuery 4, we have the button down here that's, that's AJAX, and we have when it's submitted, uh, we have it instead of actually submitting to anything, we are performing a JavaScript um, function, so a do AJAX function, then we return false. And so you may ask why am I passing in one? It's just a, a random value. I could replace that with anything. It does, it's meaningless in the grand scheme of things. I'm just using it to show that we can pass some data into this function. But the function up here now, this is the entirety of the function when performing an AJAX call. All of that long text that we had before now condenses into four lines of code. And, and four lines is even pretty generous because this should be, I mean, if you, well, if you want to pretty print it, it should be four lines of code. But if you don't want to, then you could really make it obnoxious and long. Um, but here, this is all that, that happens in a jQuery AJAX call. So we have a dollar sign, which is the jQuery object, and then we want to do a get JSON method, and there's a variety of AJAX methods out there. There's a get JSON. Uh, I forget the, the rest, the, the specific names, but there's like, there's a XML one. There's a one. There's one for just for plain text. Whatever you actually need to do with it, you can get it back very easily. So uh, then we want to get the JSON from this particular file, which is the same PHP file that existed for the other AJAX request. We're just passing it some random ID. Remember that that ID was one, even though it's not being used. It's just to show you how we can perform a query in jQuery. Just concatenate it in. Then we pass it a lambda function, which accepts some data. Now this data that's being this data parameter that's being passed to it is what is actually going to be used. It's what the actual data is from the AJAX request. So then we can manipulate that data however we want and perform whatever modifications we want to the, the, uh, the DOM and to the web page. All right. So in this case, what we are doing is we are using jQuery again to find some specific element uh, that has an ID of bar. And so this is just the CSS style request, uh, a CSS style selector. So you can use it just in addition to uh, jQuery special uh, format, like you do the colon, submit buttons, etc. You can also use the CSS style selector. We're going to modify the inner HTML with data.server time. And this, frankly, is how I think this stuff should be done. It's really nice to know how AJAX works underneath the hood and what all of it does. Um, but once you know all of that stuff, there's not usually a need to have to retype that out every time. When you just need some a very quick AJAX request, you can use jQuery to quickly get the information that you need. And this is just a callback function. This is a, um, this is a lambda function in this case, but we very easily could have defined it elsewhere and then just referenced that, uh, that same function here. So you might have seen, um, uh, well, for some reason it's not letting me type in this. this is, it's strange. So most of the time, uh, especially with YUI, you might have seen that you created a separate function uh, that would accept the data, that, that does something with that data. We could move that function up above, call it a callback or something like that, and then just pass the callback name into this getJSON method. And then it would make that line appear even simpler than it already is. OK, so that's it for jQuery and Ajax. It's really very, very simple. But um, we can do a bit more with it. So before, what we were looking at was jQuery 4, which was all well and good. But just to show you and combine the power um, of, of jQuery all in one, 
we can see how we can modify multiple elements at once with jQuery and while performing the same Ajax, um, the same Ajax call. So again, we have the dollar sign, the get JSON, uh, and then we have this lambda function that's passed to it uh, with, that accepts the data. And then you'll notice that we do something less normal here. So we have a dot foo, which would find all of the foo classes within the element, so within uh, the DOM, which in, which in this case there were two. And then we see that we now have access to another uh, jQuery method called dot each. And in this case, this is very similar to uh, like a for each loop in, in uh, PHP, for example. So in this case, you can, it's returned an array of elements that have a class of foo. In this case, there are two. And for each one, what it is doing is it is going to change the HTML to the server time. So this is just, a, just one last example that combines and shows you all of the power of jQuery. Well, there's, there's a lot more stuff going on here than, than just this, uh, rest assured. But, um, uh, or, or at least in jQuery, there's not a lot going on in this particular example. But um, you can now see that with these frameworks, you can do a lot of complex things that would take you many, many lines in JavaScript uh, with much fewer lines using jQuery. It's usually just a matter of actually learning um, how to use it or how it all works together. But that can be done very, very easily through the documentation of jQuery. OK. So this is all under the hood stuff. This is how we can work with Ajax uh, very quickly, very easily using jQuery. But what about this idea that I mentioned before of having these uh, more local application like interfaces that you want to build on your web app? So this means that you have to have a variety of um, elements available to you. So maybe, for example, you want to do something like autocomplete, or maybe you want to very quickly and very easily populate a table that can be sorted. Uh, maybe you want to make uh, even like an iPhone web app. Most of this stuff can be very easily done uh, using some of the tools that are available to us. So YUI is wonderful for a lot of, um, for a lot of their UI elements. They have a whole bunch available. And one of them is a, uh, one of them is an autocomplete field, which allows you to uh, basically just have a text field. And then as someone text types in some, some text into the search field, it allows you to uh, query a server to perform some search on that text that they're looking for, return some text back, and you can show them some data that will be auto-completed. Uh, and so this is all found on uh, YUI's developer network. Um, but once you go to developer.yahoo.com slash YUI, which I'm sure you have seen the link to many times over by now, um, you can go to autocomplete and very quickly enable an autocomplete feature on your website. So um, let's just take a look at an example just very quickly because I have some other ones that I want to show you. Uh, and let's deal with remote data, because remote data is the one uh, that you will most likely have to encounter. Remote data is just like an AJAX request that is performed live. And so what we see here is that we have uh, just a text field, and we can start typing something in to this. OK, so as you can see, it's performing some actual query against some set of data that they happen to have. And you'll notice that there's a little bit of a delay, and that's because it's actually performing an AJAX query as I type. Uh, as I type some information into a text field, it's being sent back to the server, um, and it is being returned. And so using this autocomplete, especially if you have a smaller data set, maybe one that's, that seems to be querying something like the entire internet, or at least some subset of Yahoo's search results, at least the most popular search results, Using this, you can very quickly make your site easier to navigate, particularly if you have a lot of options or if you have something that you need to uh, auto-complete. And so if, um, if you take a look at their example, the, the markup in the, the JavaScript actually isn't that difficult at all. It really is quite simple to do. Uh, the markup, for example, make this a little bit bigger. 
it really just comes down to having a div that holds not only the, um, the text field itself, but also a container, presumably where all of the results will go. But then the JavaScript is where it gets more interesting. After you uh, include all of the YUI components, then you have to um, basically initialize the autocomplete. And in order to do this, you have to, um, you have to actually get data to the autocomplete uh, object in order for it to show something to it. And, and uh, this isn't the most obvious thing from looking at this source code, but the way that it works is that after you have some code up here and it initializes the autocomplete, you start typing in some text. And then it sends that text through this data store object. So um, let's see, it's right here. XHR data store uh, dot type underscore text. So this is just a uh, YUI, um, just one of their utilities that they have. And it allows, it's a mediator and it allows you to uh, connect to a particular server and obtain some data. And it's, it's actually much more complex than just performing an AJAX query. You can do some caching. Uh, it can get some data uh, locally rather than remotely from a server. It can pull the server some, every some number of seconds. It can do a number of advanced things uh, that we really are not going to get into. But this data store is, uh, is actually pretty essential for a lot of YUI's elements, a lot of their uh, UI elements at least particularly with this autocomplete and with uh, the one that I'm going to show you a little bit later, the data table. So once you have instantiated this object uh, and you give it a URL uh, that it is going to query, it sends the, the text that the person has typed uh, under, so, so you have a URL here. I'm just going to simplify this to url.php. And this isn't obvious unless you actually um, uh, read through the, uh, the main page rather than just looking at the examples. But what it sends is after, after you start typing, it sends that data very, via a query text. So using a get string, it passes a variable called query, which you can change actually, but it, just with the defaults, it's not obvious that it's, that it's past this. And then it passes the data that you've actually typed in via this, this query string to this URL. And then from there, your PHP file is, re is actually responsible for returning some subset or some set of data that your uh, autocomplete function or that your autocomplete object is going to show. So once you have instantiated it using this, this example here, and the hard part is arguably writing this PHP file, whereas with, with a lot of other um, AJAX requests, it's not that difficult because you just need this PHP file to return some data. But in this case, you actually have to do some searching through some text. So whether that be a full text search through a database or whether you're, you're going to allow them to look for um, subtext within descriptions. I mean, it really depends on how you want to implement this search. And that can be uh, the most difficult aspect of this autocomplete. So, but by doing that, you can then uh, leverage YUI's really powerful autocomplete tool. This is very simple, but they have lots of different fancy stuff like animations. So as you type something, you can have uh, the, the autocomplete field actually like flow down, and then you can have it with a drop shadow, and you can change all of the CSS to match exactly how you want it, which is really all fancy and nice stuff. Um, but really the meat of it is right here. Now the other thing that I wanted to show you um, involves YUI but it is more specifically their, their data table. And so um, I just wanted to, to show this one to you because I think this is a neat way of getting data uh, uh, presented to users. Yes? The, the question is uh, the uh, autocomplete. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, of course. Um, yeah, so right now the way that uh, Yahoo's, so their example was implemented in such a way that it pointed to a URL that they own. So this PHP file that uh, they were querying actually is the back end that does the search within their own data store. But you, um, when you implement autocomplete on your own website, then you would specify your own URL. 
uh, because AJAX uh, queries have to be done within the same within the same domain for the most part. And so um, then you can then uh, implement this PHP file however you wish to search what through whatever data you want that autocomplete to search for. I'm sorry. Uh, I, uh, do they provide examples for the source code for their URL? I'm not actually, I don't actually know. I, I haven't uh, gone through the documentation that much to tell you if they show you how to search, but that's more of a, a question for, for PHP related uh, code. And so, um, whereas YUI seems to be more client side based, uh, I would be surprised if they showed anything but very simple results that were returned. Um, what they do show in some of the examples, uh, in, in that example that we saw in particular, was it only showed the output of this PHP file, which was just some plain text uh, that, uh, that had basically the results of the search, one on every line, which is very, very simple, very, very basic. And so um, how they actually performed that search, they didn't say. And I would wager a guess that that, that search that they use themselves or, or, is their proprietary sort of search mechanism that they wouldn't really want us to know. Um, but in the general case, I would expect that you're probably going to be using this with uh, long, say, a database like MySQL, for example. MySQL does have uh, search capabilities that you can then leverage as well so that you can search. You can then perform, when this uh, PHP file is requested, this PHP file can then uh, use a SQL statement that, that does a full text search within some set or subset of your data. And then whatever is returned from that, you can just blindly return it to the user as long as there's you know, all, of the, all, of the, all of the usual caveats in, in place. OK. Um, so, so the other one that I wanted to show you was this idea of a data store. And so what I did was, um, this was written, but I thought it would be fun to actually show the data or the results from today's marathon. So um, for those of you watching from home or from afar, today was the Boston Marathon. And uh, um, we actually already have results in. They, they've been in for, for quite a while. And so we can see some of the times, I mean, some of these times are, are frankly ridiculous. You know, averaging like 12 miles an hour for hours and hours, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but this seemed like an interesting way of, of showing you one of U, uh, YUI's controls, this data table control that we can then use to show all of this data, which includes the, the type of race, the place, um, the placements that uh, these women and, and down here, the men won, uh, the name, the country that they are from, and the time that it took them to complete the 26 and, and so many yards um, trail or marathon. So in this case, um, this looks like it is going to be really complicated, uh, really difficult to implement. But YUI luckily makes this very easy. First, before we get into the actual JavaScript, I, th I think I want to show you the PHP file first. So the data stored within the PHP file is just very basic. I didn't actually implement a, a MySQL database or anything like that. I just put it all into a large PHP array because this seemed like the easiest way to just quickly get it in, uh, onto uh, this web page. And so there, there are better ways of, of doing this, but this is just meant as a, um, as a pedagogical tool in this case. So we have here various arrays where we have the, the race um, and then the position that that person won, the name of the person, the country that they are from, uh, and the time that they, that they spent uh, running the race. And so we have all of the results from, uh, from BAA.org, which is the, the, marathons, uh, the marathons website. And this includes the women's open, the men's open, and the men and women's wheelchair races as well. And those, those times I thought, I, thought, I actually had a, a neat time uh, looking at these, um, at these results. And I thought it was interesting that, uh, um, that the, uh, the, the wheelchairs, I know that they have wheels, and, but it, Evolutionarily speaking, it just seems interesting that something that, that uh, we designed many years ago mechanically uh, and that is not geared, so as not to say it's not a bicycle, that it's not any sort of a car or anything like that, uh, someone can still operate something like that and, and still gain an advantage over other people that are using strictly their, um, strictly other, uh, not using any, any mechanical 
devices. I suppose that makes sense, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Okay. I'm sorry? Oh, David, um, he doesn't run in the marathon. I don't, I don't know if he, I guess he didn't tell you, but he volunteers for it. So he, he's at uh, some of the Red Cross stations throughout, throughout the day. And so I'm sure there's lots of uh, water giving and, and leg rubbing um, to be done at those, at those particular stations. So um, you'll have to ask him, I guess, how it was. But I, I, it's better this year, I suppose, now that it wasn't rainy and, and, and very disgusting of a day that it, that it seemed to be last year, as I recall. Okay, so anyway, back to this. Um, so we have this array, and uh, this array is, is, is it's really quite simple, but it's nested. So you'll notice that I have one array that holds all of the data. Then within that, there's just one element uh, called places that has a value of all of these arrays. So it's just an array of all of this data here. And so the reason that I did it this way was just so that when... Uh, uh, I run the JSON in code, then it actually outputs data um, that we can work with, that we can, that uh, we would expect. So uh, in this case, it would show, I guess I can just show you here. I will open this file. If it ever opens. Here it is. So I just wanted to create a JSON object that look like this. There is an element called places, and within places, there is an array uh, of arrays that contain all of the data that we need to parse out later. And so uh, that's just, that's the only reason why I implemented it this way. It's not to confuse you or to make it difficult to understand why there are so many arrays. It's just, uh, it's just to make it easier on me when I want to parse out the data a little bit later. And so there's one additional thing. You'll notice that I have descriptions, uh, an array of descriptions uh, that each of these applies to. So the women open is part of is a race. Their position is one. The name is Selena Kozki. Uh, countries from Kenya, so on and so forth. And then later on, uh, and and again, this is just meant to be done quickly and just just to quickly get this data up and running. Uh, then I iterate over all of the um, all of the data that exists and add all of those. I run this array combined so that this data becomes the key. For these values. So then uh, the arrays would then look more like this in memory. Let me erase this stuff. So after this for each loop has run, we then have um, an array called places that is itself, that itself contains arrays. Um, but in this case, we have the array race as a key that points to women open, for example, and so on and so forth. So it's just to give keys to all of these uh, individual and unique um, objects that we have, or all, just to give keys to all of this text that we have here. OK, so going back to the yui.html, we can see that we then are somehow querying for all of this data. And in fact, if you look quickly enough, when this page loads, that data is not actually loaded initially. It's, it's loaded at first, or no, it's loaded after an AJAX call has been sent, which implies that we can change all of this data at a later time. So in order to see how we do this, we have to wait five minutes after our break. And when we come back, we will talk about how this is done. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about one of YUI's UI elements, this data table. And so I didn't get to show off some of the cool things about this table. So you'll, you can actually click on each of these items and sort by, for example, name or sort by country, for example, if you want to uh, quickly or easily find some specific set of data within it. You can also modify the cells in such a way that, for example, you'll notice that the names now are associated with the URL. They're actually links, as are the countries. And, and uh, each of these then do a different thing. So in this case, when I click on the name, it actually does a Google search for that person, because I, that seemed like a good way to do it. And then if you want uh, to look at a particular country, we can just do something kind of simple, like going to 
a country's Wikipedia page, for example. And so we can modify the data that's stored within this table along with selecting what data we want to be held within it. And this is a somewhat simplistic example in that I had a very finite set of data. I query for that data. I get all of the data back. I put all of the data into this table. But there's additional things that you can do as well, such as pagination, so that you could have additional um, you could have additional pages of data if you have a lot, lot of uh, data, for example, a large set of data. Um, there's a variety of things that you can do to do this. And so I, uh, I teased just before the break, how on earth can we actually do this? Well, it's actually really quite simple. You notice that in the HTML, it's just one very basic line of code. And it is this div ID equals results. And so if you were to take a look at the UE examples, they name it something different, but I can name this whatever I wish, and this seems to make sense to me. So in this div, that is where that table is created into by YUI. YUI performs all of the generation of whatever inner HTML it's actually going to do, and then it, it puts all of that in there. It's invisible to us as users, as uh, developers, and, as, and to the end users as well. OK, but where this gets interesting is the JavaScript itself. And you notice that I'm scrolling for a little bit, but it's really not that difficult to get through. So, if you go to the examples, you can find all of the, the JavaScript files that you have to include in order to make a data table work. And so you'll notice that I have a whole bunch listed here. A couple of CSS files, which makes the table look as nice as it does with the, uh, the uh, odd, uh, odd even coloration of the different rows and, and the appearance of the, the header rows, for example, and, and, and how all of it looks, basically just overall. It's the style sheet, as you know. And then uh, what I have here are just the JavaScript files that are uh, required by YUI in, in order to actually accomplish this goal. And so there's a lot. And this, I would say, is, is perhaps uh, YUI's downfall, in, in my opinion, is that it, it gets a little complicated with so, having to deal with so many files. And then it's also, there's, they're also so feature rich that it's also just ever so slightly bloated. So there's a lot of data to download. Uh, there's, it, the files themselves can be somewhat large, whereas jQuery, even though jQuery can't make a table, and, and not even one that looks as nice as this, um, but it's just much simpler as well. So you have to pick and choose what you want to include. And so I'm just going to gloss over the ones that I've actually included because you'll be able to take a look and see on the, job, or on the, uh, the source code later tonight when you take a look at the links or the sources themselves. So in this case, what I'm going to do is on load, so um, you may or may not have seen this. I don't know if David has shown this particular event to you, but there is a YUI event that you can fire when the page is loaded. So after the DOM is ready, the page is loaded, all the JavaScripts are loaded, I can fire this particular function. And I'm going to have within it a function that I call populate table. So this is just all it is, just a, a function that's going to create and populate my table with data. So. Um, You'll notice that I have defined here a couple of functions. I'm going to gloss over them for now because it's, it doesn't, it makes sense programmatic, programmatically to place them up here, but it doesn't make sense to describe them first. So what I'm going to do first is describe the columns that make up this table. And columns is just a, Java, uh, it's just a JavaScript object where I give it a key which is associated with the data. Remember from the PHP file uh, that I gave all of, all of these uh, rows of data matching keys associated with them. And I named them race, POS for position, name, country, and time. And so that's what I am placing here. I'm telling the column what data to get, what data to fetch and place into that column uh, for that particular row. Then I'm going to give the, um, the column a label. So this is the race, so the, the women's free, the men's free, so on and so forth. And then you'll notice that I give it this additional attribute called sortable, which means that I can pick and choose which of the columns I want to be able to sort. So in this case, I've allowed all of them to be sorted. But depending on your data, this may or may not make sense. You may not want all of the, the columns to, to allow some sort of sortable action to them. OK, so you can see that I do that for a couple of these. But then down here, for the position, the name, and the country, we have some additional text called a formatter. So in this case, a formatter allows us to format the text that is placed within that field. And so this is how I'm able to format that text into links, for example. Uh, I can format it in using some sort of style sheet. I can do whatever I want uh, 
and format that particular field uh, by itself by adding this formatter. So you'll notice that I have a couple of formatters. One is just the number, just because it's, uh, it's the position, it's just the number. I don't want it for whatever reason. Maybe down the line it would make more sense uh, for YUI to recognize it as a number rather than, say, a string. Uh, maybe it somehow helps it with uh, the sortable. I'm not, you'd have to dive into some of the, the depths of the documentation to find out for sure. But then you'll notice that some of these other ones, in particular the, the name field and the country field, have form, uh, formatters that are themselves functions. And these are the ones that I just glossed over a second ago. So we have two functions, country URL and Google URL. And they are passed to them some set of data that is passed as defined by YUI. And you can look at the documentation. But basically, uh, it's passed a particular cell, which is the actual elements, the actual cell itself as a DOM element. Uh, it's passed a, a record, which I didn't use. So we're going to gloss over that. And then a column. And then the data, which is the data for that cell itself. And so um, you can actually get additional data. But this, is, this seemed pretty simple to me. All I wanted to do was change the cell's inner HTML to rather than being text to just be a link, for example. And so in this case, I just created a link, for example, for the country to Wikipedia. And then I've inserted into the URL the data itself. So th in this way, the URL has become a link to that country's Wikipedia page. I did the same thing then for Google. And of course, I just uh, made the, uh, the link correct, just as you would expect it to be, also including the text there as well. Uh, luckily, it, it, uh, there's no sort of special um, formatting that I had to do for, for example, for spaces. I didn't bother changing the spaces to, uh, to percent %20s or any of these HTML-friendly formats. All of that seemed to, um, it, well, it, it's done by the browser. But if you wanted, to, wanted it to be more correct, you should probably be sure to correct all of the, uh, the unusual characters that you might have in, in data such as this. Uh, hopefully that goes without saying. OK, so I've created these columns. I've defined the columns that I want. I've defined these formatters that are just going to make all of this data into nice little links for me. And now what I want to do is actually get the data to populate the table. And so I need to use, again, this YUI data store uh, utility that they have available. And it's, it's a separate utility. You can look at all the documentation for that. Um, but in this case, we just wanted something somewhat simple. So this is somewhat similar to the, uh, the connection utility that I think David probably used to show you uh, as an example for using YUI for AJAX. But this is different because this is, this is more sophisticated. This is how a number of controls communicate with some set of data or some storage of data or some data set uh, in order to display and modify. And this is actually required for not only the autocomplete, but also for um, this data table as well. So you, you would, if you want to use any of these UI elements, you have to become somewhat familiar with them. OK, so anyway, I instantiate a new data store, and I pass to it this marathon.php. So the, all I'm saying is that it's just a URL that it will perform the AJAX query to. That is the, the name of the file. So um, then what I am doing is I am telling the data, the data source, the data store, what I was calling the data store, I'm telling it that its response type is going to be JSON. So I'm going, I'm going to be passing back JSON from that PHP file. Then uh, I just add some more attributes like uh, uh, in this case, for the um, XML HTTP request object, the mode that I want is queued so that if, for whatever reason, this really isn't necessary in this case because I'm only performing one query. But let's say there is some, something that happens where I need to perform an AJAX query multiple times or I am, I'm just performing this AJAX query more than once, you would probably want to define how those queries are performed if you want them to be performed at once, or if one is already in progress, if it has to wait for that one to complete before it, it does the next one, that is what this uh, queue requests um, uh, ver value in this connection XHR mode property does. It allows me to define how it will handle multiple requests. Uh, the queue request mode just means that it's going to wait for the previous request to finish before it performs the next request, which may or may not be beneficial to your example. OK, now this, this is the only thing that might cause some confusion. But don't be confused. It's not 
that difficult. Remember that I defined my array to be output by JSON in a particular format. And I am defining that format in this response schema for the data source. So I'm just telling the data source where it can find the data that it is going to be outputting onto the table. Now remember that I, I also told uh, this columns, I defined this columns object um, with all of the data that, it will, that will be used. So you'll notice that I have key for race, position, uh, country, name, so on and so forth. And this has to match the data that comes back from the data source. Otherwise, you're going to get some data errors. You're just not going to see the data that you want output. Uh, so here, you notice that I have um, a couple of values to define. In this case, the first one is the results list. So um, the reason that I formatted that array uh, like I did was because in order for it to read all of the data within it, it has to access it via some, uh, via some uh, value. So in this case, I had that places value that then stored an array of all of those, of all of the data. And so what I'm saying is that this places value then holds all of these fields. So places holds, all, has, holds arrays of these fields, which are the race, the position, the name, the country, and the time. And you notice that these fields match the keys from the column above. All right, so then once that is done, all I need to do is define then the data table itself. So I use, I create a new variable called data table and I define it uh, and I give it Yahoo's, uh, I instantiate it as Yahoo recommends using this method. You notice that it has a couple of parameter results, which is the, the ID of the div that's down below. If you remember, this is the, the div that the table is actually going to be created into. Then there's the second one, columns. These are the columns that I defined up above, just so that the YUI then knows what, to, what columns to actually create. And then I pass it the data source. And then, finally, all I need to do is tell the data source to send the request. So then it performs the AJAX query, and, and behind the scenes, and all it does is it requests all of the data from that PHP file, parses it, and then once the data source has some data, that uh, the data table is then created and generated based on all of the data that we saw here. So we were then, uh, frankly, somewhat easily. It looks a little complicated, but it's, it's, especially for a lot of data, this makes it a very easy way of showing very nicely um, some of or a lot of this uh, information on one page. Any questions on that? Is there a default sort that you specify, or is it just default order of whatever you specify? Uh, so um, a default sort, good. So it, uh, right now it's not performing any sort when I actually load the page. So it's just going to show the results in the order that it received them. Uh, and so that's why, so now you see it's loading, it's loading the data. And in a second you should see that this is the same order that I uh, actually set the arrays to within the PHP file itself. You can set the default order if you wish, but in this case there is none. There's, there's, no, there's no default sort. I mean, it has a variety of other things as well. Um, like by default, you can have it append new data to the end of the table, uh, or by default, you could have it just replace the data that's within the table. You can replace specific rows, specific columns. You can do a number of things with YUI. Um, but there is, I think, a small hitch to this, and that is that um, when you are dealing with large, large sets of objects, JavaScript on a lot of browsers, and especially on Internet Explorer, um, seems to be really slow, and it would take far too long to actually generate this page. In this case, what we were seeing before was that uh, for some reason, the, you know, my wireless or the wireless in this room is just not very quick, and so it's not receiving the data very fast. That's why it seems to take a while for it to load the data and, and display it. But if you have a lot of data and a fast internet connection, this can actually slow down um, to a somewhat unusable point, at which point you should consider maybe not using YUI, but maybe instead uh, uh, generating on the server side a table that you can then send in, you know, via just some plain text and then using response text, you can just insert it into 
uh, in the inner HTML of some particular div. That way you, you are changing the burden of where this processing is taking place off of the client is if you think that for whatever reason you're, you might have somewhat low traffic but it would take a client a long time to process, you can then place the burden off of them uh, rather than having them actually generate the look of this page itself. So um, this isn't the end all be all to it. This is just one way of showing you data, giving you a variety of, um, giving you variety uh, for UI elements that exist. And there's one last thing that I want to show you. Um, YUI, or rather jQuery, has um, a variety of plugins available for it. Uh, and one of them that I think is, is particularly neat is called the jQuery cycle. And so um, being affiliated with, uh, with Computer Science C7 that I mentioned, we usually have to work with web pages that deal with photographs. And one of the things that we're trying to do is create like a uh, basically a slideshow of, of photographs for students to be able to look at and, and uh, maybe not interact with so much, but just be able to view other people's work and their own work up on the web page. And jQuery Cycle makes this very easy to do. So um, don't tell any of my um, E7 <laughs> students, because none of them have seen this. Only you guys. This is, this is the first time I'm showing this. Um, but there is. I've used um, jQuery Cycle along with uh, what's called uh, Zen Photo. It's just a back end that allows you to quickly and easily organize photos into sets. And it's sort of like uh, Flickr, but for your own sort of personal use, if that makes sense. It allows you to upload photos, tag them, organize them however you want, do whatever you want with it. So it's using a Zen Photo back end, but the front end is using um, this jQuery Cycle. And what's going on is that as one photo fades out and then another one fades in, it uses sort of a faux Ajax to query for the next image. What I mean by that is that it's not, right now it's, it's downloaded all of the images that it is going to show you. So in that, in that respect, it's not Ajax that, that uh, every time that it wants to show another image, it, it has to make some sort of a random decision about what it wants to do. Um, but if we were to look at the source code itself, you'll notice that it's, it's actually kind of uh, very, let's see, very, where is it? There is, oh man, it's not showing up. So there's, uh, usually you see this large block of text that represents all of the photos that are being shown uh, on the page. But what happens is that it is only text that is, that is shown. And the reason that this is beneficial is that, um, oh, here it is. I'll show you, I'll show you on this source. So in this case, this is just a really large object containing all of the uh, image files and names and their sizes that the web page will work with and actually show on a slideshow. However, there's a lot of images here. If, we just, if I keep scrolling down, you'll notice that the text sort of goes on and on and on and on. And if we were to load all of these images at once, we would overload somebody for sure. I mean, there's a lot of images here. And, if you've ever been to a web page where it has to download, you know, 100 or, or more images and it just delays everything and it takes a long time, it's really annoying and we wanted to avoid doing that. And one way that we can do that is this notion of lazy loading. So if, for those of you that are, are programmers or, or familiar with uh, programming concepts, you may uh, be familiar with um, lazy loading in other contexts. But in this context, we can use lazy loading to only load something when we actually need it to appear on the web page. So in this case, not all of the images are being shown at once. And in fact, only one is being shown at a time. And you notice that one image is shown for a few seconds, and then it fades away. And then another image is shown for a few seconds. So we have a little bit of leeway in there where a, the next image could actually be downloaded to be displayed for the user. And what this does is this places, this removes the burden of having to download all of those images at once. It helps the JavaScript start running immediately because it's not continuing to download a lot of this data. And so uh, you can do this using Ajax. And in fact, um, for most, uh, for anything, any lazy loading that you do involving text, you probably should uh, use Ajax for. Uh, a number of, of people use, uh, or a number of websites use lazy loading in, in text format. For example, Google Calendar will, 
lazy load. Uh, if you have a lot of events in one particular day uh, and you start scrolling down in that day, it won't load all of the events, but as, as you start scrolling down, it will start loading additional ones. That's an, another example of lazy loading. Um, but in this case, um, the way that we can accomplish lazy loading is through this same sort of idea as, as before, where we can, uh, in, where we can actually um, just set placeholders for all of these images, and then later on insert images into them. And so uh, what happens is that we have all of these images that exist here, and what the way that jQuery cycle works is surprisingly simple. You point jQuery cycle at one particular div, and that div would have a number of images or subdivs within it. So as an example, um, let's say that we have one div, and normally what you would see if, if you were to do this without jQuery cycle is you would have like uh, two or more images within it. But what happens is that uh, you hide two of these images, and it's because these images are in the HTML, jQuery cycle knows to cycle between each of these elements within this larger div. It's actually really smart, and it's very simple, and so it, it can degrade quite nicely if, if JavaScript isn't working for whatever reason. You wouldn't see the nice animations, and the image actually probably wouldn't change, but you would still see an image, so there's no sort of JavaScript uh, trickery going on. So we hide all of those images, and then every so often uh, an event fires, so we can define the amount of time that happens, where this image is taken off of the screen, and then this image takes its place. And so we can do that by a number of animations. Uh, we have, um, uh, let's see, we have zooms and fades and all sorts of really fun, uh, funky sort of animations. But uh, most of them, I think, are, are, are pretty, uh, they're not very useful. Usually, you just want something kind of simple in order to, uh, to change between different images. Uh, so you can see that all of these are cool, but you know, not really very useful for us because we just want a very simple fade. So I guess it would help if I made this a little bit smaller. And so what we can do then, uh, once we have loaded uh, at least one image, is at every time cycle or jQuery cycle inserts another image in its place, we can fire an event to load the next image that will then be used in that, in, uh, that will then be used next. And so if we take a look here, uh, we have some prototyping. The main, the main part that happens is this fetch slide function. And so what we are doing is that every time that some event from jQuery cycle fires, we then run this, uh, this fetch slide to try to get the next slide and have the browser load it. Um, and just to give you another example of this, let's see. Uh, I will bring up Firebug here. Uh, have, has, I'm sure David has shown you Firebug, but if you haven't used it yet, it is definitely, definitely recommended. Uh, let's see. All right. Try reloading this page, and we can see that as uh, images are fading out and fading in, we can see new images appearing. So we can see that, okay, we have another one that just downloaded as that one came up. That was the next one. So then as that one is shown, now we've downloaded the next image in its place. And so we can only, we only have to use so much bandwidth uh, that we actually need to do, and we can move some of this load off of the user. So now coming back to this, it's really quite simple, the logic. We're just using jQuery here, and, and again, just showing off some of jQuery's power, where we need to find some particular image. And so in this case, we've defined all of these images as placeholders. So we've defined their size and we've defined their alt attributes and various other things because we have that data already up here in text. But we haven't yet put the image source in this image placeholder so that the image then cannot be loaded. So then what we can do is later we can go, by, we can go back and actually find the images that are missing those particular uh, source, or we can find the, the next image that is missing that source, and we can build a new image tag that has the source within it and insert it using jQuery into 
the web page itself using all of these tricks that, uh, that I've just shown you. So whereas before we were, uh, it was getting, uh, you know, there's only so much we can do with enabling and disabling buttons. There is now, you can now see a lot of the power that exists through selectors in a real world example of actually finding specific elements within it. We can find specific image elements and then load the source within it. We can have the browse, we can tell, we can give that particular element an image source and then the browser will then load it and it will be ready to show as soon as jQuery cycle has completed its cycle. Okay, so uh, I think we'll end a little bit early, but uh, thank you all very much for coming and for your patience with me and um, David will be back next week. Have a good night.